Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, the number one podcast for drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, tradition, and more. Welcome to the 106th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest of the show, Stephen Gould. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. He is the master distiller at Golden Moon Distilling in Colorado. But for those less familiar, let's start off with the distillery. It was founded both by you, Stephen, and also Dr. Karen Knight. Right. That's my wife. Early 2008. They do lots of things. He is, so this is actually an award-winning distillery. It was named a Distillery of the Year in 2019 by the American Distilling Institute. It has received numerous other accolades, top distillery in Denver in 2015, best distillery in Colorado in 2016 and 2020. The list goes on and on and on. And you also have a speakeasy style tasting room with a world-class cocktail program. They're also in co- Right. And also highly award winning. In fact, Gin hmm. Magazine named our speakeasy as Gin Bar of the Year this last year, 2021. Oh, wow. So I don't think any distillery taste room has ever gotten an award, an award of that stature. We're really kind of blessed. I've got an amazing team and, you know, we're, we're getting globally noticed here in Golden, Colorado. So I can't really argue with that. <laughs> and uh, during our episode, we also have a, um, a few whiskeys here. Um, you know, let me just start off with this and hopefully we'll, we'll get rolling to talk about, uh, golden moon. So first we have, it's a very curious, it's a clear whiskey. It's, uh, I'll let you pronounce it, but basically I'm going to terribly describe it as like an American moonshine scotch, right? So it's a shochu. So shochu is a family of Japanese spirits. Mm -hmm that are double distilled in much the way sake is double distilled. So they're distilled for with our, our double fermented rather, and then, and then distilled. Mm -hmm. So they're distilled using both the yeast as you would with a whiskey. Mm -hmm. Um, But then with a koji, which is a grain, typically rice that's been inoculated with mold. Mm. So what the mold does is it metabolizes complex carbohydrates that the yeast will not consume so it gives you a little more, bit more alcohol, a little more mm. efficient, which is why sake can get to the high levels it gets to without distillation. Hmm. But in shochu, what we're going to do is we're going to take that fermentable, whether it's it's rice, corn, uh, mountain yam, sweet potato, buckwheat, hmm. or in our case, uh, barley. Yeah. And we're going to double ferment it and then distill it in much the way we would a whiskey. But it's not technically a whiskey. Oh, it's oh, it's not. It's not technically a whiskey. Mm. It is barley. Hmm. It's very, very closely related to a single malt. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, in Japan, a lot of your a so mugi is the Japanese word for for uh, barley. So this is our mm. mugi shochu. Mm. Uh, a lot of your aged mugi shochus look suspiciously like whiskeys and act suspiciously like whiskeys, but that input of the mold. Uh, gives it an earthiness and a flavor that is a little bit different than you're going to get off of just the yeast fermentation. Wow. It's silkiness. It's a, it's an earthiness. It's a, um, uh, an umami, if you will, mm. that you wouldn't typically get out of a standard yeast fermentation. Mm. I, I lived and worked in Japan for many years. Mm. And I like shochu. I think we're the only only kosher shochu in the world. I don't know that for a fact. <laughs> and I started giving it to my friends in Japan that own bars and they love it. Mm. So right now we've just started distributing it. It's really not our priority. Our whiskeys are. Mm-hmm. But it's certainly 100% two row Moravian malted barley. It's mm. a single malt shochu, if you will. Mm. Uh, all the barley is grown in Colorado, Idaho, and Wyoming. Mm. It's all malted within three miles of the distillery. Um, it's grain to glass in the distillery as are all our single malts. Mm. Um, the water we use is all Rocky mountain runoff. So it's water from the clear Creek and Montezuma watersheds of the Rocky mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, we use a proprietary yeast. We use, uh, the same mashing process that we use for our single malt whiskeys. Mm. And it's a really fun product. And not only are my friends in Japan really digging it, but bartenders around the U S are enjoying it. And it's really usable in much the way a rum would be usable in cocktails. Oh, interesting. Because it's got that that kind of a 
an earthy note. It's not quite as sweet as a rum, but it's got that barley sweetness. I was going to say there's it almost like dates. There's a little bit of a fruity sweetness, darker fruity sweetness in there. Absolutely, right? it, it works in, in any cocktail that calls for a rum. You can pull off with this. Ah. Every barley product, every malt barley product we've ever made here at Golden Moon. Mm-hmm. So all of our single malts plus the show shoes yeah. have won gold or double gold. It's at the World Spirits Competition in San Francisco. <laughs> Oh, wow. That so is really pretty impressive. proud of that. Like I said, I've got a great team uh-huh. and we're really blessed. We've got beautiful ingredients to work with mm-hmm. and um, it works. Yeah. And I mean, I really thought it was a like a moonshine whiskey, but it's M- Moogie Shochu, you said? So Moogie Shochu. So Moogie is barley uh-huh. and Shochu is the style of spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're calling it a moonshine really isn't that far off because <laughs> uh, I mean, Shochu is often referred to as Japanese moonshine. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really not that far off. It's, it is mm-hmm. typically an unaged spirit made from a variety of different fermentables, mm. in our case, barley. Yeah. So one thing that you mentioned uh, while you're describing this is the only such m- mugi, I'm going to mispronounce this, mugi shoshu produced oh, yeah, at a coach, uh, under kosher supervision. So, uh, uh, you know, one thing that does um, certainly set your distillery apart is that it uh, is under kosher supervision. It's under Earth Kosher, right? That's and they're, correct. They're a Denver-based uh, kosher certifying agency, well, right? So they're, so they're actually Boulder-based, but oh, Boulder. okay. their real offices are in New York. Hmm. And the lead rabbi is Rabbi Adler, who was the senior kashruch uh, rabbi in, in Canada for about 35 years. Mm-hmm. And he moved, he, I, I guess he retired and came out of retirement. He was good friends with a rabbi that's based here in 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 Boulder. I actually found them because the rabbi at Chabad in Cherry Creek Mm -hmm. said, you know, I was talking to a variety of kashruk organizations and and looking at the list from the guys in Chicago, which ones are better. Hmm. And he said, look, look at Earth Kosher. And lo and behold, when I looked at the list in Chicago, Mm -hmm. it was like the second or third kashruk listed there as being good. Wow. And so they're highly respected, even though they're a very small organization. Mm -hmm. Um, they're relatively easy to work with, except mm. when they're not, but that's sort of the way it goes. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But we've got a very good relationship and they've asked me to make some changes and do a few things here and a few things there. So and- I, I want to I talk about those. So up until at least as of the, this present recording, although I imagine by the time this get, gets published, things will change, but you've got this the the spirit we just drank as well as uh, a couple whiskeys behind me mm-hmm. so you've got a bunch of whiskeys that are that are certified as kosher but you've got other products that are going to come under uh their certification as well correct so that's correct so we have two still houses mm-hmm. so one still house our, our second still house which is our big still house mm-hmm. um anything is produced in that still house which also includes our gin mm-hmm. is currently kosher except for some of the whiskeys that are finished in used wine casks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What we're doing now in the next two weeks is that we're we're going to be doing deep cleans on the stills and still house number one, mm-hmm. which in harvest season we use to process grape products. Mm-hmm. And then we're koshering still house number one, which will make all of our products with the exception of our grape grappa mm-hmm. and the whiskeys I just mentioned that are finished in 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 wine cast, but either port or vermouth cast. Mm-hmm. Every other product, so that's our, our gins, our liqueurs, our absinthe, our apple brandy, mm-hmm. and of course, all of our whiskeys will mm-hmm. be kosher. Now, they're not kosher for Passover, but they're kosher. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk about, maybe later in this episode, I, I definitely want to talk about some of those other products that we, we'll get to those. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, so how did you, so it's, it, it's been around for nearly a decade and a half. How did you start the distillery? I started home brewing in high school mm. and I figured if I couldn't buy beer, I'd make it. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I've been working in restaurants since I was 13. Mm. Um, I'm third generation restaurant folk, if you will. Oh, okay. Uh, my grandfather emigrated from Russia, but was a pack peddler, mm-hmm. settled in New Hampshire had a dry goods store, open sort of a lunch counter, dinner counter, if you will, diner. Mm-hmm. Um, then opened a, a hotel, uh, at George's Mills in Lake Centipede. And so my mother and my aunt worked in the family restaurants. And so 
when I got bar mitzvah, I figured, hey, I've been a mitzvah. Theoretically, I'm a man. <laughs> I'm going to go out and get a job and get some money on my own. Mm-hmm. And went out and, and found a job as a washing pots and pans in a small restaurant mm-hmm. and argued with my parents and said, hey, I'm 13. Guess what? And so they, let, you know, they, they gave their permission for me to work. Mm-hmm. And I've sort of been in love with food and beverage ever since. I'm probably one of the few people you'll ever meet that got promoted to busboy, <laughs> um, you know, from, from working in the pots and pans. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, now I'm, you know, I've got multiple master's degrees. I'm, uh, I've had several careers, um, but I really started in food and beverage and, you know, it keeps drawing me back. And so I started uh, brewing beer in high school. In college, I worked in restaurants and bars. Um, at one point, worked at a small cafe in Reno called Du Grenet, which in the 80s actually had, had 30 single malt scotches on the back bar, mm. which was unheard of in the 80s. Anyway, <laughs> and sort of fell in love with whiskey, started with a, a whiskey called Boonhaven 12. Mm. It's an Isla whiskey, That's very right, good yeah. whiskey. Mm-hmm. I had this brewing skill and uh, in graduate school, I opened a, a brewery with some friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I tried to open a distillery and was talked out of opening a distillery. I made some very bad and, and n- more than a little illegal single malt. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then, um, I was talked out of opening a distillery by a, uh, a luminary in the industry named Fritz Maytag. Hmm. And Fritz suggested that I go get a real job and learn how to run a business. Hmm. And so when I got out of graduate school, I went to Ford Motor Company and um, built a career there. Hmm. Um, but as soon as I hit Detroit, I, I I started running into people in the alcohol beverage industry. And mm-hmm. while I was at Ford, uh, uh, I started exporting brewery overstocks from what was then Stroh's. Hmm. Um, I was working in Asia at the time and going back and forth to Detroit. Mm-hmm. And um, still fascinated with distilling and brewing and et cetera. Um, ended up working part-time in India and started uh, exporting distillery overstock from Allied Demek in India into China. Hmm. Um, still visiting distilleries and learning and taking classes. And mm-hmm. uh, I discovered absinthe along the way. And so I used to spend uh, time in Europe when I was vacationing uh, uh, going to little absinthe distilleries and learning from what was then a very underground absinthe community, mm. um, which I became a part of. And mm-hmm. my interest in absinthe sort of drew me back into this. Mm. And then uh, in 2008, uh, I had left the corporate world and was running a integrated logistics company that I founded mm-hmm. and decided to open a hobby business uh, distilling absinthe. Oh, okay. And really, that company mm. is the company that we own today. Mm-hmm. And um, I developed a very, very good palate and a very, very good skill set in botanical distillation. Mm. And then revisited my my early days uh, distilling off of barley. One thing led to another, and now I I work. You know, I own my own distillery. I work as a consulting master distiller. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics, as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you, and now back into the show. What have been upsides, maybe some challenges? Obviously, this is all weeks in advance of getting that that uh one of your ha- the you know all the liqueurs and all that stuff being koshered but um before you even do that how much opportunity i guess both you know pros and cons how how's it gone well so to be brutally honest i'm not kosher i am jewish mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um a lot of my family is kosher a lot of my friends are kosher mm-hmm. i'm not um i'll eat and drink just about anything mm-hmm but I decided, uh, my wife and I decided that we wanted to go ahead and get the certification. Mm-hmm. It's not a very big market, mm-hmm. but it's an underserved market. So all my liquors, my liqueurs, my absinthe, the gin already is. I'm really excited that the Apple brandy is going to be kosher. Looking through the catalog that I perused, 
there are some obscure products that I've never come across before. So I, I guess I'm curious, A, I don't remember what they are. So A, if you could share what they are and then B, how you, how you generated an in, not only an interest in discovering these sort of obscure 19th century liqueurs, but also how you found to make them. Some of them are far older. I will not be the first kosher absent, not by a long shot. I really started looking once I, I started developing this botanical skill set mm. at other botanical liquors and liqueurs. Next came creme de violette, which mm -hmm. started as a cancer cure. Dry curacao, which is a, a curacao orange liqueur. I then discovered distiller's notes in a collection of papers I'd bought in France. Distiller's notes tied to the Amer Picon distillery in North Africa in 1851. So Amer wow. Picon is a very old, old Amaro or liqueur mm -hmm. that was developed by a, an Italian distiller that had become a French citizen and served with the French army in North Africa named Gatian Picon. So the name translates to Picon's bitters. And he developed it as, an, as a cure for malaria. I created a product that is very, very close to the original. My product was a little more peppery, a little hotter, if you will. This is a kumul. Yes. I had never heard of that before. Kumul is a caraway uh, liqueur. In Central Europe, Eastern Europe, they drink kumul. A lot of Jewish-owned distilleries, especially in Germany, in Austria used mm -hmm. to produce kumul. The next we have ex gratia. Yeah. What is that? So, ex gratia is what's called a modified genepe. So the term genepe is a French term mm -hmm. that's used for a family of liquors and liqueurs that are made out of lesser wormwoods. Mm. Absinthe is made out of grand wormwoods. Mm -hmm. Genepes are made out of other members of the Artemisia family, which slang is genepe. Hmm. And even some of the Latin or scientific names of some of them have gen the word genepe in them. Oh, wow. Okay. So hmm. in, the, in the Alps and the Pyrenees, the term genepe is commonly used. Mm -hmm. But in Sweden, for example, they call them Bosque Brandvin, or more famously, the chartreuse products. Mm. So chartreuse is a genepe or a oh, modified genepe. So these... Uh, oh, all, I mean, you're going to probably push back against me, but these obscure sort of beverages really came out of your fascination interest in absinthe right they're associated well, it, in one it, way or another all things food and beverage but really stemming from going down the rabbit hole and learning about a different style of distilling mm -hmm. than perhaps most people practice mm -hmm. i mean i started as a whiskeyman i am today a whiskeyman even though i do all this other stuff Mm -hmm. There are people that will call me a gin distiller. Um, and I very often, because I'm in the worshipful company of distillers in London, mm -hmm. I've gotten a lot of press for my gin. Wow. Um, I, I regularly have people say, you're not a whiskey man, you're, you're a gin distiller. And I've been <laughs> making whiskey a lot longer than I've been making gin. And I've won far more awards with my whiskeys <laughs> than I have with my gins. Yeah. But, you know, I also make rum. I make shochu. Mm -hmm. Um I've hung out with my friends down in Mexico and I, I've, I've, I've made tequila with them. I yeah. don't own a tequila distillery. I'm not in Mexico. Otherwise, I'd probably be doing that as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm fascinated by all things distilling. Being able to experiment and do all these different things mm -hmm. really is, has helped me develop a palette that is a big piece of my living now. I hope you've been enjoying this episode so far featuring Stephen Gold. If you like American-made alcohol products, Here's a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Jeff Morgan. I've definitely become a, a, an active member of our tribe uh, yeah. since I started making kosher wine. And wine has been an important part of that story, part of that journey. It's yeah. been the, um, I think driver. it's been the, yeah, the driver. It's, yeah. it's the centerpiece. I hope you enjoy that sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Jeff Morgan. That's going to be a fun one, just like this one. And now back into this episode featuring Stephen Gould. Speaking of whiskey and distilling, you also have this Principium. It's a Colorado single malt whiskey, basically like it's scotch, but made in Colorado, right? I would not say that. So yeah, I trained in Scotland and I'll tell you the Scottish distillers that I know, we talk about a lack of opportunity to experiment with other things. Oh, really? When you, if you work in Scotland and you make whiskey, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And unless you go out on your own and play around, you may never have the opportunity to make a kumul. Right. So a lot of my Scottish friends that are incredibly talented distillers mm -hmm. don't even know where to begin with this because mm -hmm. they've never had the opportunity to do it. That's, now, so I, I will say I, I, I had some folks over the other week 
uh, to try these. Mm-hmm. One of the guys who, I mean, he's a big scotch guy. So he was like, where can I buy this Principium? I enjoyed it um, and drinking and I enjoy it now. It's funny going from the, the Mugi Shochu to this. So it, it, this has a lot. I mentioned the other one had a like a dark fruit sweetness, dates, maybe raisins. This one has, it's like a, I don't know, brown sugary sweetness to it. So when we decided, and you, you asked about Scottish whiskey and said this is sort of a Scottish whiskey. Um, it's not. The reason it's not. Not um, technically, but it's barley, right? It is barley. Yeah. But barley is used to make still products all over the world. Mm. So I mash sort of, sort of like a Scotsman, sort of not. Um, most of your American single malt producers, and it's a growing category, and this mm-hmm. falls in that category, mm-hmm. mash like brewers. Not everybody. Mm-hmm. And we're all, I mean, the good thing about the American craft distilling world is we can do things that a lot of other parts of the world can't. <laughs> yeah. We get to experiment a lot and do a lot of different things. Huh. And so most of your American single malt producers, most mash like brewers and you get a different result. Mm-hmm. I mash totally unique. My mashing process is closer to what a Scotsman would do, mm-hmm. but it's sort of upside down. Hey there. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I want to break in again. And if you have ideas beyond the show, beyond the podcast, beyond this video content, if you have ideas for what Jewish drinking can bring you, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's Zoom sessions, maybe it's uh, events, maybe, who knows, swag, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear from you any ideas, things that we can do, uh, things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. Absence mm-hmm. really drug me back into distilling. Mm-hmm. And when I opened uh, the company that is now Golden Moon, mm-hmm. originally we were just going to make a few hundred bottles of Absinthe. Oh, really? And oh, so really then, a side project. Um, well, I was running a logistics company that I'd founded Mm-hmm. That did a lot of government work. When things got really ugly between the Tea Party and the Obama administration mm-hmm. and a budget couldn't get passed, we started losing business hand over foot because there was no budget uh-huh. and we were small business. Mm-hmm. And one night my wife and I sat down, this is 2010, mm-hmm. and looked at each other over dinner and said, why don't we just close Ghoul Global and make the distillery a going concern? We let our, co- our government contracts run out, close Ghoul Global in 2016, totally pivoted on what we were going to do with the distillery. It's now my primary vocation. So that pivot was 2016, six years ago? So we really started pivoting in 2010. Oh, okay. And here we are in 2022 with a critically acclaimed distillery. We're, you know, we're in five countries in, in or four countries in Europe. The United Kingdom, I used to say five countries in Europe, but the UK left Europe. So there you have it. I um, mean, we're in Taiwan. How did you be, learn your distilling trade, your craft? Uh, so be- that's, I, I have probably the most atypical career path. I started by learning how to brew beer. And really, if you're making a single malt, the front end is technically a brewer anyway. All whiskey is mashed, so you're mashing. I was a poorly trained brewer, as I like to say, but I just kept researching and studying and taking classes. Um, I got involved with the Institute of Brewing and Distilling and started taking some of their classes and got their basic certification as a cereals distiller. I went down the absinthe rabbit hole and I'm a book nerd. So I started collecting books and reading and experimenting and taking more classes. And now I'm teaching classes and consulting and writing for various publications. And so it's not really the typical career path, if you will. But here we are. I think anybody who checks out your LinkedIn page knows, I think in a heartbeat, it is atypical. You just mentioned different publications. One thing I noticed is that you're an associate editor of Artisan uh, Spirits Magazine. Is that correct? That's correct. How many other Jewish distillers have you come across? And and I am also, by the way, I'm also kind of curious geographically. Does that differ America, England, elsewhere? You know, um, so historically, there's a large Jewish tradition in Europe of distillation. Mm-hmm. It's one of the trades that Jews operated in mm-hmm. fairly uh, openly, yeah, even I, during during medieval times. Oh, even then, oh wow. I, I was going to say, I only learned about that recently because a lot of, especially in the 19th century, when Jews were making bourbon in America, that's correct, because a lot of them had the background 
in Europe. That's correct. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So there's a huge tie there. In the modern world, you still find a lot of your older companies with the, that still have major stockholders that were Jewish that, that started with Jewish distillers. And then you have modern distilleries. My friend Daniel Soar, for example, at Cotswolds. You find there's a burgeoning craft distilling community in Israel. But even, you know, I spent a lot of time in Argentina in a prior career. The distilling history of Argentina is probably 80% of the distilleries owned in Argentina in Argentina's history were Jewish owned. Wow. I just poured myself this uh, this bourbon in rum cast, right? So how do you, uh, it has a nice sweetness to it, I will say. Thank you. And, and also like a round smoothness too. So it's not as fiery. It has this round smoothness to it, which is really, pl- I mean, uh, right off the nose, it's got like a cinnamony, brown sugary sweetness to so it. That's, this gunfighter is our, is our found spirits whiskey brand. We partner with a variety of distilleries, mostly a distillery called Green River in Owensboro, Kentucky. And so anything that says Golden Moon is either distilled or redistilled at Golden Moon. Anything that says gunfighter is distilled by somebody else, typically Green River, but we we do some work with some other distilleries. Mm-hmm. We bring those whiskeys in, finish them typically at our distillery. So in the case of the whiskey you're drinking, mm-hmm. we took a young bourbon that was distilled at Green River, and then we brought it in and we put it into Appleton Estate rum casks. And Jamaica, finished Jamaican them. rum, right? Jamaican rum. Mm-hmm. Um, we've actually switched to a, bar, uh, to a Barbados rum at this point. Oh. In both cases, uh, because of COVID, Appleton stopped selling their barrels. Why? Uh, they they were having trouble getting new barrels, so they they, they used them again. Uh, supply chain. So we Do you got, know anything we, about supply we chain? We actually reached out to our friends <laughs> at Speyside Cooperage. Uh huh. They found us a new barrel. Oh wow! And so we now finish all of our rum finished whiskeys in another distilleries. And it's funny because hmm. in both cases, the the barrels started at Heaven Hill as bourbon barrels. Oh. Then went to the Caribbean where they were used for rum. <laughs> then came to me where they're used for whiskey again. Uh-huh. And then for me, they'll go to a cider where they'll be used for cider. Oh, lovely. Oh, so, actually, more than lovely. That sounds incredibly delicious. It's incredibly delicious. It's also <laughs> recycling. It's reusing. Yeah. All the gunfighter products mm. are whiskeys we start with elsewhere. We do port finished bourbon and rye, which obviously are not kosher. Well, I'm not we going to get that into argument, that. But, but Rabbi Adler's not buying it. So they're not certified kosher currently. There we go. I think that we can agree on. It's not certified kosher. Whether it's kosher or not okay. is a whole other conversation. The rum finished bourbon and rye is kosher certified. The vermouth finished, and we partner with Dell Professor Vermouth out of Italy. The <laughs> tequila finished bourbon and rye we're about to launch Ooh. will be kosher certified. And that's in partnership mm. with Fortaleza in Mexico. Ooh. They're friends mm. of mine. They're great people. Um, and even better, as soon as they we make can get barrels from tequilas. Them, what? I had I had a neighbor gift me an añejo of, of theirs. It's delicious. Portolais is an amazing product. Yeah. Um, I mean, their bottles are right here, as you can see. They're also gorgeous looking um, they're bottles. They're good friends of mine. Guillermo's a, Guillermo and I are drinking buddies. I am so excited to be partnering with them on this. Hmm. The problem is with COVID, with the supply chain issues, we've been talking about it for a year and we haven't been able to get barrels up here yet. Have you Have you offered your consulting uh, background? <laughs> <laughs> the problem is issues. I only need a couple of pal loads. I'm a yeah. small distillery. Yeah, yeah. If I were buying a truck load, it'd be easy. Uh, oh, oh, interesting. But here in Colorado, things are so dry. If I buy a truck load, by the time I could use them all, the barrels yeah. would be destroyed. Oh, oh, wow. Hmm. So, I mean, I only want to buy enough barrels to fill my needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to figure it out, even if I have to drive down there with a truck myself. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because Guillermo actually drove up here last year for a visit. Oh, yeah? And it was on that visit, we decided we were going to do this. Mm-hmm. And if I'd only known, I would have had him throw four or six barrels in the back of his pickup truck. <laughs> it would have yeah. solved the problem. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, I mean, is what it is. It anyway, is, yeah. so those, so we do all, all the gunfighter secondary cast finish barrels. Mm-hmm. Then we do some older releases. So up until recently, we had on the market Gunfighter 13, which is kosher certified. Mm -hmm. And that is a 13-year-old Tennessee bourbon. Oh, wow. We've done some limited releases of 15-year-old bourbons from Tennessee and Kentucky, Mm -hmm. all of which have been certified. And we're about to launch Gunfighter Masters Blend, which is essentially a blend of 15-year-old Tennessee bourbon and young Colorado single malt we've distilled (laughs) in-house. (laughs) <laughs> and it's delicious. 
Oh my goodness. And it is kosher. Wow. Certified. Certified. I doubt we will ever do a grappa, which we do as well. That's mm-hmm. kosher certified. One of these days, I think I might convince my cousin to put a still in his winery there in central Israel. Yeah. I, that'd be, I, I really don't know the Israel market if they have any grappas going on, but there are a few grappas in Israel. There's, oh, really? you know, most, most of your, your grape distillate that's technically a grappa mm-hmm. is marketed as, 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 as Arak. Oh, interesting. Hmm. You know, or Rocky, or there's a lot of big wineries in Israel that have small stills that put out a white spirit and mm. they call it what the market wants to call it and they drink <laughs> it and people are happy <laughs> and I'm happy for them. Yep. yep. You know, there's a reason that spirits are called spirits. Yeah. And that's because they touch the spirit. They should mm. make you happy. And if they're drunk responsibly, they do. I'm ready to go down this absinthe wor- wormhole. So oh, how yeah. did... So how did you, I have so many questions. I mean, obviously absinthe itself, but you've, you've repeatedly mentioned underground absinthe groups or, or, or I don't want to say societies, but people, why so were they underground? The you, you, and and by the way, you also mentioned earlier about a lot of misunderstandings or, or a lack of knowledge of, around absinthe. So, and they all tie together. It's all the same conversation. Alrighty. So absinthe pre- 1880 was viewed as a medicinal, very positive substance. Things that contained wormwood were viewed as healthy things. They were used to cure colic. They were used to cure any other types of stomach ailments. They were used to as, as cure-alls in many parts of Europe. And apothecaries, regardless of, of, of religious affiliation, embraced these botanicals. Mm. and their use with wine and spirits. As I said, as far back as ancient Egypt. Absinthe started becoming mainstream popular when a doctor named Pierre Ordinaire purchased the recipe from a Christian nun named Sister Enriad in the, in the, can, in the village of Covey in the canton of Nachutel, Switzerland, along the French border in the Jura Mountains. And Dr. Ordinaire was Jewish. Hmm. He rode around on his horse named Roquette. We know this because it's part of history and and all these names have become absent brands. You see these names <laughs> reappearing and reappearing. Mm-hmm. So when people talk about Roquette absent, they're actually talking about an absent named after a horse. <laughs> okay. So um, he rode around for 10 years selling absinthe like a snake oil salesman mm-hmm. and making a fair amount of money mm-hmm. in France and Switzerland. And then two business people, uh, Henri Pernot mm-hmm. and Major Dubaud, who was a French army officer, mm-hmm. bought the recipe mm. and decided to, to commercialize it on a grandiose scale. Mm. They built their first distillery, which was the first Pernod distillery, mm-hmm. in the French village of Pontoyer, which is about 10 miles from the Val de Travers, which is where Covey is in Switzerland, but just across the border in France. Mm-hmm. And they did so for tax reasons, just like our modern tariff issues. Mm-hmm. That's why Pontelier <laughs> was where absinthe was commercialized. So they were very good at marketing. Mm. Members of the Pernod family started spinning off and opening their own distillers. At one time, I think there were 18 members of the Pernod family. And some of them even changed the spelling of their name so they could do so. And again, mm. they were Jewish. The um, Pernod family? They were Jewish? were Jewish. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Another enterprising family jumped on the bandwagon, the family Mugner, and they operated in Dijon. They were very good at lobbying the French military. So they sold the French military absinthe as an anti-malaria. The wormwood is used as an anti-parasitic and it works as an anti-parasitic. Malaria is a parasite, so they argued it would work. For 80 plus years, the French military bought absinthe from the Mugner family, but it doesn't work as an anti-malaria. <laughs> and that's the whole Amer Picon story I told. But so the French military was fighting wars in North Africa and to a lesser extent in Mexico of all places. And they were giving the troops absinthe on a daily basis to cure malaria or prevent malaria. So the French soldiers developed a taste for absinthe. So in the mid 1850s, French nationalism is is at an all time high under the rule of Napoleon III. So people wanted to drink the drink of the troops. Absinthe. (laughs) You get to the 1860s and the blight comes, Veloxra. And it wipes out the French wine industry and the French brandy industry. Oh, wow. The demand for absinthe explodes. I'm sorry. It's very trendy. It's the drink of the troops. I can't even get get my head around wine not being produced in France. Like That's so like devastating. The French wine wine economy at the outbreak of Veloxra, or the French economy, 
Yeah. 43% of the economy was based on the production of grapes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the entire grape industry was wiped out by Veloxer in, in the, in the, in the mid 1860s. Oh, wow. Now that's also why the classic Sazerac cocktail in the U S mm-hmm. yeah. was originally made with brandy, not rye whiskey, but oh. you couldn't get French brandy in new Orleans because of Veloxra huh. and rye whiskey was the preferred Brown spirit in the U S market. So right. that cocktail, the old, the first true cocktail mm-hmm. was made with absinthe and brandy mm-hmm. originally, and mm-hmm. now is made with absinthe and rye whiskey because Which, in the 1860s, there was no brandy. Wow. I, I do have, to, since you mentioned the Sazerac, that was my introduction to absinthe. As I, it should be. I Well, had a Sazerac because I, I like <laughs> my whiskey based cocktails. <laughs> That was my introduction to, to absinthe really was through the Sazerac cocktail. That for most people is. Oh, really? And oh, that's yeah. absolutely appropriate. I mean, huh. you know, the French merchants in uh, New Orleans, when it was a French colony, mm-hmm. many of them were, were, were Jewish. They were all tied to the absinthe industry. <laughs> this is my wife, my co-founder of the distillery. Hello. Hello, Rabbi Hello. Drew. Nice to meet you, Dr. Knight. The cameo. <laughs> so that is my lovely wife. Mm-hmm. The brainchild behind Golden Moon Speakeasy, I might add. Ah, it wasn't you. It was, well, I was a bartender, but she really said we need to do this and do it right. Wow. And so the Speakeasy, which, as I said, award-winning Speakeasy, we're in our eighth year. It just keeps getting better and better. I mean, even the distillery would not exist if it were not for Karen. She is my soulmate, my partner and everything. So back to France. mm -hmm. So. No cheap wine, no cheap brandy. Lots of people jumped on the absinthe bandwagon. Absinthe became all the rage, but a lot of bad absinthe started being produced as well. Mm-hmm. It's a very difficult spirit to make. It's a very expensive spirit to make. And so what you started seeing was people using things that probably should not be used in alcohol. So for example, I have in my collection of, of pre ban absinthe, mm-hmm. and there's a misnomer that all pre ban absinthe are, are amazing. That's not true. <laughs> I have an absinthe called absinthe Lenore. Mm-hmm. There was actually an American made absinthe from the 1880s mm-hmm. that is literally colored with chromium. Not you know this, something you want to be drinking. You know what this makes me think about uh, America in the late 19th century is this was all pre bottled and bond act. And it's so there was all, it was like it's all wild, prohibition. Uh, I mean, it's all pre, you know, there was a lot, there were no controls. Right. So like late 19th century America for spirits sounded like the wild west that people would just put whatever in their spirits. Oh my God. I've, I've got, so I have lots of rare books. Yeah. I have a book from a dry goods store in Roseville, California from the 1880s. Yeah. It is a handwritten recipe book. Yeah. And the recipes, cause they would, they would, they were selling all kinds of liquor uh-huh. and they were ways to counterfeit French brandy and <laughs> Irish whiskey and et cetera. <laughs> And the ingredients are absolutely terrifying. Oh, oh, wow. You know, I mean, hmm. it's someone actually said, we should try making some of these. I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't need to. I'm uh-uh, not going there. Yeah. So you had these, this absinthe that was being produced, some very good, some very bad. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, in the late 1800s, France consumed per capita more alcohol than in any other place in time in human history. The only it, place to come close uh, yeah. is the United States. I was going to say 1820s, 1830s, America was consuming a lot. Well, 1880s, 1890s, they were consuming more. Really? <laughs> and so well, the reason I bring led, up 18 and 20s, 1830s is that was when the whole temperance movement started in the 1820s. Exactly. Because Americans so were drinking temperance so movement much. Grows. It, temperance movement grows. Yeah. And that temperance movement, because of this, this rampant alcohol consumption, yeah, hits France in the 1880s and 1890s. Now, in the <laughs> 1860s, the wine industry was wiped out, and the French elite spent 20, 30 years rebuilding that industry. Oof. Then the temperance movement comes. Mm-hmm. So the way to avoid what happened in the U.S. with prohibition was to vilify apps. So they waged a propaganda campaign that, with a very heavy dose of anti-Semitism in it because of the large number of Jewish producers of absinthe. Well, this is also the Dreyfus trial was the exactly. 1890s. Exactly. It's uh-huh. all tied together. Wow. 
It's all tied together. I had no idea the Dreyfus trial had anything. Well, okay. It, wow. all, it absolutely wow. did. And in fact, during that period of time, you had Christian absent producers advertising that they were not, their absence was not Jewish owned. Wow. In the press mm. to try and avoid being run out of business. Oh, wow. And so finally, in Switzerland in 1912, mm -hmm. absinthe is banned. Mm -hmm. Three years later, it's banned in France and the US. Everything shut down. And it was shut down based on bad science and propaganda with a heavy dose of anti semitism And it stayed shut down, even though, and this is beautiful, the US law was written to allow vermouth to exist. So vermouth has wormwood in it, same as absinthe. Mm -hmm. The chemical that was blamed for absinthe evils is thujone, which mm -hmm. occurs in a variety of botanicals, including wormwood and including common sage. So thujone was vilified, wow. but there was a loophole designed for vermouth that said anything less than 10 parts per million of thujone mm -hmm. was absinthe free or was thujone free. Mm -hmm. So that was legal. Now here's the here's the whole studies in the in the late in the late uh, 20th century showed that 80 percent of your pre ban absence were legally under U.S. law thujone free <laughs> and couldn't and shouldn't have been banned. <laughs> A buddy of mine named Ted Bro worked on this, and then independently, the folks at Kubler in Switzerland worked on this, and they both separately petitioned the U.S. government, and in 2007. The U.S. government agreed and absinthe, and it's, it's a little more complex than this, but mm -hmm. long story short, absinthe was legal again in the U.S. So it was actually legal in Europe in 2005. And so now, as long as you can, you can, you state that it's through Joan free, and if necessary, you can surprise, pass a lab test, mm -hmm. you can sell your absinthe in the U.S. So. Uh, you know, 2007 is a very interesting year because that is, if I know my history correctly, that was one year before the founding of Golden, Mill, Golden Moon Distilling. Is there any correlation between that closeness in history? Maybe. <laughs> I was like, that's Maybe awfully just a close. Little bit. Absolutely. So once, it, once it became legal, then you're like, wait a second, I can produce this legally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so I already I already had this huge collection of rare books on distilling. I already had I'd started buying antique stills as well. Oh wow. So I have a huge collection of antique stills, some <laughs> small, some large. Uh -huh. If you look behind me on the back bar, that still, for example, is actually from the 1800s and it's a gin still that actually came out of a firehouse in London. So mm -hmm. I have antique stills in the distillery that I use. I have antique stills, obviously, here in the house. I realized that I had the equipment on hand in my garage mm -hmm. to start an absent distillery. Oh, wow. And that's so. Uh, that's what we did in 2008 was we we incorporated in the state of Ohio. Did you and say Ohio? And working on, on going into production. Did you say Ohio? I did. Wow. I was oh. living in Beechwood at the time. Oh, okay. Um, we actually moved. Uh, Karen had an, a business opportunity with a medical practice here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And she actually moved out here in 2009. Mm -hmm. I stayed in Beechwood until my son graduated high school mm -hmm. in June of 2010. And then I moved out here as well. We reconstituted the distillery here and went into production in 2012. And now we, you know, we make 20 products. Uh, we have a 10,000 square foot production facility that's about to grow to 15,000. And we're in the middle of a capital raise, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a crowdfunding raise through, raise through WeFunder, mm -hmm. www.wefunder.com. <laughs> if you're interested, go, go on, look for Golden Moon, mm -hmm. check us out. As little as $250, as much as however much you want to invest. If you invest 50,000, you'll get a free cask of whiskey as well. Ooh, that's definitely enticing. And we've had we've had half a dozen people do that. So, wow, that's awesome. All right, well, this has been great. If you say you saw me on this blog and you want to come visit, mm -hmm. I'll try and give you the tour myself. <laughs> if I'm go. not available, the lovely Kaylee will be more than happy to do so. Come I, visit the Speakeasy. So I, the Green Fairy is what they call absinthe because it enchants you. And traditionally, they would have happy hour in France during the height of the Belle Epoque, the absinthe era, mm. or the golden era, but it was really the absinthe era. Was that late and 19th century? they would century? literally call happy hour the green hour. Is that also what um, inspires your visual aesthetic of the labels? For the liquors and liqueurs, absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay. You know, a lot of these were very popular during the Art Nouveau, the Art Deco periods mm -hmm. for all the liquors and liqueurs. I mean, that's also the era of the classic cocktail. And these are all cocktail ingredients. Stephen, this was phenomenal. This was fantastic, incredibly insightful. Thank you so much. And uh, L'chaim. L'chaim. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for listening and tuning in. <laughs> L'chaim. I'm going to stop the recording.